In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And so I make the sign of the cross as I begin, and I will also make the sign of the cross at the end of the sermon. And I'll tell you why. Because uh, when I was a student, some nearly 50 years ago now, (laughs) my mentor, Dr. Richard Kemmerer, helped me. Uh, What a very, very kind man. when I think, uh, J- former President Jimmy Carter said something once, and whenever I, I think of what he said, I think of Dr. Kemmerer, uh, who, by the way, wrote the book on homiletics and preaching. The two books. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy Carter once said that when he was a young man, he used to think a lot about people who had strong intellect and were very, very smart. And he valued that greatly. But he said as as he's gotten older and older, he values kindness. Whenever I remember him saying that, I think of Dr. Kemmerer, who was so very kind to me. And he's the one who told me about making the sign of the cross, because when I was a student, I was and had been forced to preach a few times. and had been finished my internship, and I was um, in my last year, and I told him uh, one time as we met monthly, I said, I just don't think I'm gonna be able to do this. And I was talking about preaching, of course, and leading worship. And he looked to me kind of sorrowfully and said, my, you think an awful lot of yourself. <laughs> And how insightful that he saw that I was focusing on me and not letting go. What an insight. What a wonderful, kind man. He said, do the preparations, prepare yourself, and trust in the Lord. It's so simple. And he said, and if you must, make the sign of the cross then, at the beginning at the end, at the end, and the cross will hold you up. And it has. And I suspect that it has you also. In times of sorrow, and in times of plenty, and in times of not so plenty. I grew up on a dry dirt farm in North Dakota, and we didn't have much plenty. (laughs) And I ended up being uh, suggested to me when I was seven years old by my pastor in that little country church. I could tell you the whole story. It's, It's, you know, amazing to me. But I'm reminded of that story today because He suggested that I be a pastor someday. I was seven. (laughs) What in the world? Well, I'm here today because Pastor Seth Novak has invited me. And in 1995, I was an interim pastor in Great Falls, Montana at Redeemer Lutheran Church. And Seth was in my confirmation class. And I suggested to him one day that he consider going into the ministry someday. And I hope he doesn't hold it against me. (laughs) But I saw in him already then what I'm sure you have discovered, a deep, deep kindness and compassion and love. And so, in today's readings, we hear those words of encouragement to love and to forgive. I'm here to proclaim to you once again, as we do every week, and and even every day in our own prayers and in our own 
personal devotional life, we remind ourselves and one another that Christ has died for us. And we make the sign of the cross. And as a, as a, in, in a childlike way over the years, I have said, God the Father sent Jesus to earth who died for me and lives in my heart. I once had someone say to me, well, what's with the backwards cross? I didn't know there was a right or wrong way to make the sign of the cross. But I, not, now that I notice sometimes, I guess there, some people do it differently. I, I don't know. But I've said, God the Father sent Jesus to earth, who died for me and lives in my heart. I commend that to you today, that it will be uh, the cross that holds you up as it has held me up through all times and in all circumstances. I want to thank Seth for inviting me here today to be with you. So let's look at the readings. And do we have a wealth of readings today, huh? Isn't it? I mean, I didn't know where to begin or where to end, so I hope this doesn't, I hope I don't take you here too long. <laughs> but this, this is really some great stuff. The, the Old Testament lesson uh, is uh, this uh, story of amazing forgiveness and mercy. It's like uh, Joseph is now like the one who sets the example for us. Now, I'm near 74 years old, so I've had a lot of years to hold a lot of grudges. And I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> but it has not served me well. You know, I think it's kind of weighed me down and aged me beyond my years. Joseph it gives us another example of how to deal with injuries that we've taken personally. And we all have them. No question about that. And some in the years that I've known all the people of faith that I've been in contact with some have demonstrated to me an amazing healing power of forgiveness for others and themselves. To not hold that grudge, but to be a healing source for ongoing life in relationship with one another in, in this world as we wait together. If you want to read the story about Joseph, you got to go. They start here in Genesis 45. You got to go to chapter 37 and read, you know, and even before that, and, and read the, the whole thing. And it gets a little convoluted and a little repetitious. But that's because a lot of Genesis is combined from, from hundreds of and thousands of years, maybe in between different redactors found different pieces of literature, and it was the same, and they kind of put them together. You know, the difference between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, the two different creation accounts, might be hundreds, thousands of years. Different authors. You know, it wasn't just written like a, a novel. It's the history, the holy history. The Germans have a word for that, the Heilsgeschichte, the holy history. A peculiar history of the holy God and, and the word. It's, it's a, 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 the, the history of God's relationship with God's created people and redemption of those people through Jesus Christ. And so you have to read chapter 37 and following, but finally, eventually, you get to this beautiful story, and, and uh, you heard it read so beautifully, and then eventually, Joseph says in chapter 50, I love that you have to read on from this part here, and his, the whole thing about how he treats his brothers who have sold him into slavery because he was a dreamer, 
and he had some visions of what might take place, and now they end up coming back to him, and he does not hold it against them. And he says these, these words that I think someplace along the way I've experienced, and maybe you too, he says to his brothers, you meant it for evil against me in chapter 50, verse 20, but God meant it for good. Somehow God can use, with God nothing is impossible. We know that verse, right? And we know that message in our hearts. And somehow God can even use what is evil in the world for some good. And as a side note, in 40 years in the ministry, and my beloved wife Ellen here is with me today, has heard me say too many times that in those years, the one thing I think that I regret is that I underestimated evil. because I've seen a lot of it. So we do not underestimate it. Joseph doesn't minimize what was done to him. That's what makes his act of love and mercy and forgiveness so, so magnificent, is that he forgives it. He recognizes it's evil. He doesn't dismiss it. He doesn't say, oh, that was okay. But he forgives it because God used it for good. Astounding story. In the New Testament reading for the day, Paul is trying to encourage his readers as he writes the letter to the Corinthians. And he's in essence, using uh, what little he knows about agronomy and agriculture to say, well, you know, there's going to be a resurrection and you're a fool if you try to figure out what kind of body you're supposed to have or whatever, but, you know, trust me, there's a resurrection. <laughs> and um, we have to go in Corinthians uh, chapter 15. You go uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, in the readings, but early in that chapter is where we have the first creedal formula and where, where uh, Paul says um, that uh, we have a, a message of greatest importance. And then he goes on to say that Christ died and was buried and was raised again. I think it was two or three weeks ago that was the lesson for the day. Dr. Kemmerer, going back to my mentor and dear, dear friend, said to me, you know, you think, uh, you, you don't want to be thinking of yourself because you're not that important. He said, but never forget that the message that you have to share is of greatest importance. And I think of that 1 Corinthians passage that I just uh, related to you. And so each time I have the opportunity, and now it's uh, less and less frequent, to share with people like I do with you today the hope that we have in the life and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus, we think of I think of it as being extremely important that we continue to gather and to assure one another and to encourage one another. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in, in his little book, Life Together, that talks about Christian community, always says that we need each other in the faith because when my faith is very weak, yours is strong. And when yours is weak, Mine is strong. The Christ in you needs the Christ in me, Bonhoeffer says.
And then the gospel. My goodness. The gospel reading for today. And gospel means the good news. And there isn't a lot of really good news in this. About two, three sentences in, I'm going, oh, man. <laughs> Did you want it to stop? <laughs> you know? I, there's a, a sense of the imperatives. <laughs> Jesus starts out by saying, well, I say to you li that listen. And in fact, if there's, there's some translations there that might say, uh, because he began last week with the blessings and the woes and the beatitudes and, and all of those things. And so he, Jesus then says, but I say to you that are still listening. <laughs> because you might have turned me off by now. And then he lays it on really heavy. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Now, I can't get much further than that, and I'm already saying, <laughs> I'm not up for this. Bless those who curse you. Really. Pray for those who abuse you. Is he serious? I mean, I've, I've read this literally hundreds of times. And every time I read it, I think, is he kidding here or what? But see, that's the difference between human and divine, I suppose. Jesus calls us to that great calling. You are called to be Christian, to be followers of this Jesus. The challenge Jesus lays out is that we aren't going to be expected to do things in the usual way. As he says in the second paragraph, even the sinners love those who love them. Hmm? But we, you, are called to love those who hate you. Love your enemies. If we're honest with ourselves, we're, I, I go, I'm gasping and saying, these words are too difficult to hear. This is law. I think of the Latin phrase that I was taught to memorize, lex semper accusat. The law always accuses. And each time you read something that, that is this striking, if you're pretending that you can do this, then that's the height of hypocrisy. And the other side of it is despair because we know that we cannot. Are we unwilling or unable to do what Jesus would call us to do? Well, both, really. <laughs> Save with God all things are possible. See, that, that's the miraculous thing that I have witnessed in my life, and I have seen people like you and me called to do something we didn't think we could even do, empowered by the love of God in Christ Jesus to love even the unlovable. I've seen it. I've been inspired by it. I've been shocked and surprised, wonderfully surprised actually, sometimes at the immense faith and hope and love as Paul would describe it in his letter to the Corinthians chapter 13, right? And the greatest of these is love. I've seen it. And the transformation that can take place in people's lives as the love of God is shared. Jesus is talking about us living in a different world, in God's world, God's kingdom, not this world kingdom. 
If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. (sighs) Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Sounds like you'd be uh, a fool. but fools for Christ. Loving even those who hate you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Okay, I can, I can understand that. Treat others as you would want to be treated. Forgive as you would want them to forgive you. And then it seems it's harder to hold a grudge because I know what I also have done. (laughs) I think about my dear mother who now has passed, who taught me about love as a child. And when my father passed away, she was only, uh, uh, my dad died quite suddenly of a heart attack. Mom was uh, 46. And we lived in that close little community, you know. Uh, we didn't go very far. We didn't, she didn't travel very far. And so the, 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 when we finally got a telephone, the, um, the gossip increased. Because that's what the community does in those places, is they gossip about in one another. And when my father died, my mother had a revelation because then they were talking about her. And she said to me once, I had no idea the pain that can be caused by what we do in in talking about others. She said, now I know. In a way, the evil of the death of my father came to good because my mother became wonderful beyond wonderful. How it changed her to grow in faith and hope and love. Not that she wasn't one of the redeemed already, but you know what I mean? It really, it really changed her when she recognized what it was like to have been uh, the gossiper. And those are, that's, that seem, might seem like a small thing, but when I realized that, that my mother had, had, had grown in that way, it really, really did my heart good. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even the sinners love those who, who love them. The harder thing is to love. Love those and forgive those who want to hurt you. Now, now I, I'm not saying that this is, this is easy. And Jesus, I don't think, was thinking it was easy. You know, Gandhi is quoted once as saying that he would have become a Christian, but he just never met one. And, and I think that was recognition of the impossible calling that Jesus calls us to. And we can, I say impossible because only possible with God. And today I would remind you that you and I are the transformed people, the redeemed sinners who can, in fact, be called to love. I know it's a stretch. But we are those who have been called to love even those who are our enemies. We recognize that we are helpless without the miracle of Jesus' victory over sin, over all the brokenness, over our hate, over all things ungodly. We know that it is only through Jesus 
who promised the disciples that he would send them the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, that empowered them to be his followers and to be people of faith after him. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. The Gospel reading today is about mercy, and we remember the mercy that has been shown to us in Christ Jesus. Today we gather as we always do because we recognize our failures, our inadequacies, and our powerlessness. But God's power is at work in you. Be assured once again of God's mercy. We have confessed our weakness. We remember today our baptism with the sign of the cross. We remember his sacrifice for us as we come to the Lord's table and receive the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sin. That it may, might, the mystery of that sacrament might empower us to be the redeemed people of God. We celebrate that holy meal, the supper, to strengthen us in our faith, to assure us of God's love and mercy, to grant us peace in the face of all the things that are confusing and chaotic and that, frankly, we don't understand. And, and I remind myself and you today that because we have this high calling, we remember that we have a great God who does not abandon us in this calling and empowers us to be even more than we think we can be. We are to be a holy people. That word in the Hebrew when, when talks about God is holy be therefore holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. The word has kind of a, a nuances that means peculiar. The people of Israel believed in a holy God, meaning that their God was real. That's what made their God peculiar. Yahweh, I am, over against those who are not. <laughs> They were false gods because they weren't. What made God's people holy and peculiar is that they had a God who was. You and I have a holy God who is. The grace of God is infinite and his mercy is everlasting. Today we stand reminded then that God's love through Jesus Christ our Lord is for you and for me and for all. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.